technical problems. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start this meeting really with um, a minute silence for remembrance and for in honour of Lord David Shutt, who recently passed away. Um, a guy who I <laughs> am honoured to have spent time with um, campaigning around the streets of Greetland, a man who's devoted his life to politics from the age of 17 year old, uh, so he spent 60 years in politics. He's done so much for this community, for Calderdale and for the country uh, through his, his work in the House of Lords. Um, it was only a few weeks ago that Lord David Shutt was with us in a scrutiny meeting uh, with a talking about a fantastic piece of work with regards to reform of the election process. Um, so I think it's only fair and right that this moment in time we give him that respect by giving him a minute silence. So if you'd like to put yourselves all onto, onto mute for the minute, everybody. From now, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate that. Right, moving on to business. Um, so thank you, everybody, and welcome to the Strategy Performance Scrutiny Board, Wednesday the 4th of November. Um, we have three items on the agenda this evening. Uh, one's a report and two, two verbal items. Um, number one, substitute and nominations for this meeting and apologies for absence. No. Sorry, apologies from Councillor Scullion. Right. Okay. Okay. Members' interest. Uh, do any members have any disclosable pecuniary or any other interest which would prevent them from participating in any discussion of the items or participating in any vote upon the items or any other interest? No. Okay. Admission to the public. Uh, there are no exempt items on this agenda this evening, so public are in and watching live on, on YouTube. Um, we have two lots of minutes to agree. We have the minutes from the Strategy Performance Scrutiny Board held on the 9th of September and the 14th of October. So do we have a, a proposer and a seconder for both? We have Councillor Robinson proposing and Councillor... Happy to second, Chair. Uh... Councillor Holden to second. Thank you, Councillor. Item number five, uh, the annual complaint, compliment, complaints and compliments report. Um, this is an opportunity for members to review the annual corporate complaints and compliments. Reports relating to children's social care and adult health and social care have been presented to the relevant scrutiny boards. Uh, this, I believe, is Richard Noble and Andy Furness presenting this report. Hey, yeah, thank you. Okay, so it's thank you. over to you, officers. Thank you. So I uh, I've produced a 1920 complaints and compliments report. It's all been circulated for, for your attention. Uh, just to summarise, uh, the year saw a slight increase in complaints. Uh, from 189 to 211. Uh, one of the reasons for the increase was 
uh, council tax in chief executives had quite a, a large increase that year. Uh, the overall complement uh, saw a decrease this year. Uh, this has been highlighted with the director uh, and we're currently looking at ways that we can uh, highlight the good compliments that we receive within the council. Uh, within, within this year, the local government ombudsman have uh, done an investigation into a council tax complaint uh, and this has resulted uh, in a public report. Again, this has all been circulated uh, along with a briefing note. Uh, the public report has uh, been in the press and public notice has been, been uh, placed to, to acknowledge it. Uh, and on the back of the report, an action plan has been produced uh, highlighting where we can improve as a service and as a council uh, addressing the concerns that they've raised. Uh, new procedures have been developed that we're working towards and a whole new training session has been been designed and will be bookable on iTrend in the next few days. Uh, so basically, uh, we're open to, to any questions that you've got regarding the report. Uh, Robin's here from Council Tax to, to address any concerns in that area with the public report. Uh, so open to any questions. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, interesting report. It's... <sighs> I must admit, it's, it's not good to see that the complaints have gone up so much. We understand, obviously, there are certain things that do contribute to complaints, and that's when we change things like the, the street lighting. I know there were quite a few came in from that. Anything major that we do within, within the borough can create, obviously, complaints. Um, I suppose it's how we deal with them, uh, which shows how effective we are as, a, as an authority at uh, reducing them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite worrying that they're actually on the increase, unfortunately. So members, it's uh, over to you, Councillor Holden. Thanks, Chair. Um, having been at the sharp end of, um, of the council in the last 12 months, um, we've, we've just got to get better. In, in, in many respects. We do a lot of stuff that, that is very good, um, but quite often miss out on, on some of the finer detail. Um, I'll give you a prime example. My next door neighbor bought uh, what was the Halifax Bank in Sorby Bridge. And about six months later, somehow, and I have still to this day do not know how, I received a council tax bill for that property, so a business rates bill. After the best part of an hour trying to get hold of someone at Calderdale, now bear in mind I'm, a, I'm an elected member, after the best part of an hour trying to get hold of someone, I gave them all my details, I gave them the owner of the property's details, thought that was the end of it, and yet Another six weeks later, I still got another bill in my name for a property that I have no financial interest in. I have no connection with whatsoever, apart from the fact that I held a bank account with the bank in that building when it was open as a bank. That is the only connection. We've got to make sure that our information systems are functioning 100%, and, they're obvious, and they obviously aren't. You know, so whatever we've got to do to tighten up, whether it's an IT issue or whether it's a customer services training issue, I don't, I don't honestly know the answer. The people at the coalface will know the answer, but we need to tighten up on these things. You know, if if I'd have been a normal member of the public, I could, have, I would have been quite within my rights to place a formal complaint against Calderdale. You know, now as it as it happens, the matter's been dealt with but it's not good enough. You know, we need to get better and we need to learn from mistakes such as, as the complaint that's been lodged um, and, and any others that occur. Now, obviously, I don't know how many others occur and they dealt with before they get to the point where, where they end up at the ombudsman. But, 
you know we need to, we just need to get better at, at dealing with things straight away in a in a timely manner. Thank you, Councillor Alwyn. Sarah? Yeah, if I could just come in there and say, you're absolutely right, Councillor Holden. We, we do need to do better, and that's absolutely the direction that we're heading in. We're doing everything that we can to make sure that the systems that we have in place support us in providing great customer service. Uh, and I'm sorry that you've had a really poor example there. Um, the number of complaints that we get as an authority in if you compare those with the number of transactions that we do with the general public throughout the year are very small. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that generally our service is good, but that's not to, to take away anything from what you just said. That isn't a great experience and we will do better next time. Thank you, sir. Robin? Yes, uh, just to echo what Sarah has said, really. Uh, I mean, that's obviously from a, a customer service point of view. Um, I'm obviously operational lead for council tax, so it's it's not good to hear that um, these things. Even though you, what you mentioned, council was um, a business rates. It's you know we, we with similar things obviously with council tax and business rates. It certainly shouldn't take the length of time it took, and there should be answers a lot quicker as to why that was done. So again, just to echo what Sarah said, um, we do need to to tighten up if you like and get better. Um, we do have quite a few complaints coming through um, the complaints and compliments about council tax. However, most are dealt with um, in, in house, obviously, before it goes to the ombudsman. And even those that do, um, I think Richard will, will probably um, back me up on this. Most are dealt with in our favour. Um, but yeah, they, they're certainly from your own experience and from one or two other customers, we do need to to make sure that uh, the customer can get through, get through to us quickly without any issues. And also, we can resolve the problem, um, you know, as soon as possible. Okay. With the complaints that we've had, have we actually managed to identify what the issues are that's causing these complaints in the first place? There can be a lot of different issues, really, Council. I mean, it's 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 not necessarily just just straightforward things like we've mentioned. Sometimes when there is a change in in uh, in systems or how we've done things, say for a number of years. Um, we're always looking at to try and you know improve the collection rate. That's that's obviously what we, my team are there for as well. Um, so sometimes it might be a case that we'll we'll increase uh, the speed of the reminders going out or, or summons and things like that. And people obviously don't always like that, but it has been evident that that does improve the collection rate. So we've we've got to balance it up really on how we're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always easy, and we're always going to get criticised at some point. Um, but again, the customer sat service side of things is something that, yeah, we certainly want to be uh, on top of. Mm. Okay. Councillor Dickinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a look at the appendix uh, and th there was an intriguing one which I couldn't find further details of. I don't know if I've missed it elsewhere about the, uh, the uh, noise complaint about the church bells. Um, I was just wondering if you could give a bit of an outline on that, please. Um, um, I find it a strange one that it got, got to an ombudsman's level. Um, I don't know if, if anyone else saw any further details about that particular case on, on the uh, other, other members. Yeah, was that one of the, on the public report, was it? Yeah, I think it's published on October, um, yeah, earlier in, in October, but um, yeah, after seeing the, uh, the appendix, uh, receiving it yesterday um but um so yeah i was just wondering if um what the general outcome of that was in terms of how it got to be an ombudsman's complaint at all yeah the excuse me the, the church bells one uh was to do with noise pollution coming from the bells and the fact that the service didn't uh put noise recording equipment in the property so actually monitor the noise the church bells was was making. Uh, so the fault was was in the grounds of uh, that they didn't follow what the ombudsman believed to be the correct procedure. Uh, but if it helps, I can share more details of it tomorrow. I can get the information, you know, some more specifics and share that with you. Yeah, I'd be interested. Thank you. But I'm, I'm, I'm actually just finding it slightly extraordinary that anyone's going to be complaining about the noise of church bells. Yeah, yeah it, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. 
Yeah, I think I've got that in mind, actually. Uh, Councillor Mayu? Yeah, thanks. Just on that last point, I think people complained a lot about sort of call to prayers when the, when the azan was going on um, in, in Park Ward. So I think people do actually sort of, you know, take these things into account uh, in many ways. Just on, on the point of complaints, I'm, I'm not so sure, well, I'd like to know how these complaints are collated because we get a lot of complaints in our own right, uh, but these, are they actually included in these sort of statistics or are they not? Because I don't know, uh, you know, people that are talk to us about and, and sort of talk about the services that we provide or not provide and then they tell us it's your job to uh, complain because we're complaining to you. And certainly I don't know whether that's actually sort of taken into account or not. So, you know, how are these calculated in a sense? So, all the, all the complaints that, that land with me are included in this, in this report. Uh, if a complaint's dealt with with a service, I don't make any records of them. Uh, everything that comes in, either from the service, from the public, from the website, Whatever lands on, on the complaints team is included in this in this formal report. But we also get many service requests, don't we, through our team? And that's just people wanting things done. So we just get them done. Yeah. Councillor I think I'll pick it up as well in, in what you were saying there. There's, there's a lot of complaints that come via us as well as ward councillors and usually go to the, the heads of directorates to be quite honest because I think if a complaint's actually escalated to our level as a councillor it obviously means that person not been able to resolve their issue going through the usual channels. That's right, yeah. So if the complaints have come via us then how are those complaints actually monitored as well because there is also times when people might just come direct to us to start with and we don't know what channels they may have tried or, or not tried so we'll just do what we do best and, and and deal with it to be quite honest so i, I know i mentioned the other day that i wonder if there's a, an email we can also add to the system when we are complaining to somebody like yourself sarah that, uh, come in at this point sarah yeah just to really um if i can just um cover what Richard and Andy were saying there. As a local authority, what we want to be able to do is to deal with any inquiries or concerns that are raised by the general public. Um, and we would deal with those as we would deal with any other uh, request for information, request for service, as Andy says, and we'll just deal with those and get those done. Um, we will record a formal complaint where somebody says, I've I've tried to get this sorted out and you've clearly not done what I needed you to do. I need you now to investigate it because the, the, is, the issue and the purpose of a, a complaint system is to investigate what's gone wrong and what's led to the complaint and to learn from that experience so that we can keep improving the way we deliver services. Um, so things that come through to you as councillors, we would expect you to um, to know who to speak to and who to who to get it dealt with. And as long as it's dealt with in a fashion that the um, the resident is, or business is happy with, then we wouldn't record that as a complaint. No. Right. I think I think we should uh, because at the end of the day, I mean, I can have five or six complaints a, a week sometimes. Uh, and all those complaints to us as ward councillors could really add up at the end of the year. Councillor Holden? If you want to... Oh, um, sorry, 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 do you want to on that? Okay. Um, just, just following on from what Sarah said, and, and I think we've got to be very, very careful um, on, on this front because... I mean, we we do filter out quite a lot of of earache from from the community, you know, without without a shadow of a doubt. But there are there are there are two distinct differences. There is someone complaining about a streetlight being out or dog fouling or whatever else. That's just general. Is it a complaint or is it just raising an issue with us? You know, and that's what we've got to be very very careful of. To me, a complaint is someone complaining about 
a light out half a dozen times over a period of 12 months and the council doing absolutely nothing about it. Now, that to me would be a valid, what I'd class as a, a proper complaint. It's not raising an issue, it is a complaint. You know, and they, they'd be quite right to do that. Um, so we've got to be very, very careful that we, we don't end up exaggerating exaggerating the numbers and the figures. You know, I mean, we, we get we get a great deal of, of stuff right. Um, let's let's concentrate on on the areas where there is there is issues and um, and just focus on that otherwise they'll end up being being swamped with you know we won't pick out the the bits that do need fixing we're just going to end up being swamped by general issues that are raised um and it's important that we make that that distinction between the two i think mm. you are absolutely right council holden I, I agree with you on that one there. Um, I could just give you an example of that. If somebody reports a miscollection, mm. they generally want it collecting. If we check the records and we've missed three of the last four collections, then we will put that in as a complaint because something needs doing. I think, Chair, can I just come back on that? I, mean, I think it is, yeah, can I just say? I think it is important what Council Alden is sort of saying that we don't want to sort of exaggerate some sort of the things. But I think I have had situations whereby I think people have sort of rang me up and sort of said, I need to sort of sort this out and can you help me do it? And we've done it and we've dealt with that situation and the, the people have been quite happy with it. But then they've sort of come back and sort of said, well, the, this particular person I spoke to in the council wasn't very you know, obliging or wasn't doing this right and I want to lodge a complaint and would you do that for me? You know, and that's when, when I'm sort of saying, one, there has been once or twice where I've actually sort of had to sort of go, go through with that process and sort of say, this person has actually lodged a complaint and can somebody keep me informed about what's happened as a result of that? And as said, it's quite rightly sort of saying, in that case, people have come back to me and sort of said, oh yes, this was lodged, it was investigated and this is the outcome of that. And I think that, that's what's important. But I think there has to be a central, for us as counsellors, to sort of say, because I think I can make a judgment in terms of what is a complaint or what is just an inquiry. Because I, I you know, if people want their bins emptied, a light light switch, uh, a light bulb, sort of thing, that, that I can deal with. Do you know what I mean? But it's just making sure that there is a system where all complaints are actually captured. So that's what the point I was trying to make. Yeah, yeah. And is that something then we, you think we can actually look at, Sarah? Sarah. Yeah, we already have that system, Councillor Bellinger. We have a system where people can lodge com complaints either online, over the telephone, um, it, send an email in, and they all get recorded on Richard's system. So that system's already there. Um, I think probably after the meeting, Richard, if we could just share the link from the website with the members of the committee, that would be helpful. Yeah, we'll do that. So when it gets to the stage then that we have to get involved with a complaint from a constituent, then that actually gets logged into that system. Yeah, the, the online system. I think again, if you... Sorry. Go on, Richard. Yeah. No, yeah, I was just saying the, on, the online system, if it's used on the website, once it's completed, it will automatically email through to myself. So right. everything that goes through that system, we will have oversight of from the beginning. Right. Well, the thing is, we don't usually, I don't, and I'm sure most members don't use that system. We go direct to the heads of that directorate with our complaint because that way we know we're going to get things done. Or to the cabinet member, even. Councillor Holden. Sorry, Sarah, I'll come back to you. I'll let Councillor Holden come in. Just like to ask a quick question um, with regards to vexatious complainants. Um, what what sort of numbers are we are we experiencing on that on that side of things? Uh, currently, uh, I think we're on four or five at the moment. Uh, we only had one or two until before lockdown, and then we've had a we added about three during the last lockdown period. Uh, but we've not the ones that are, they've been made vexatious. Uh, They've been known to us for a while, uh, but then obviously as lockdown started, they had, you know, more contact with us, and so we've gone through that process. 
So I think it's five we've currently got. Our vexatious complaints then, do they actually add to those numbers that we're seeing here today? Uh, not not particular. Uh, I know two of them, for example, their complaints were from years, years gone by. Uh, but they still keep coming back with the same complaint, wanting di wanting an outcome that's not feasible. So we've just made the decision to stop contact with them. Okay. And is that is that legal? Yeah, it's all it's all done with an appeal. Uh, Ian's aware of them all. He's the appeal contact. Ian Hughes. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, I interrupted you before. You were going to come back in. No, that's okay. I'll just cover on the vexatious complainants as well while I'm on, if you don't mind. Just to say that it's not a decision that we take lightly. We're here as a council to take feedback from the people that we serve and we want to hear from them if there's things that we can improve on. Unfortunately, we will always get some people who don't want to listen to the answer that we've given. Um, and when we give them the opportunity to appeal to the ombudsman and the ombudsman also doesn't find in their favour, they don't want to accept that. And you know, we've only got a finite amount of resources and we need to make sure that we direct them in the right way and contact with people that isn't adding any value to the community is not something that we can, we can manage anymore, I'm afraid. So that's in terms of vexatious complaints. Just to say in terms of complaints from councillors, where you do escalate them to senior officers to deal with, anything that comes my way that I look at and think, actually, this is not just a request to get something done. This is, this is a genuine complaint about the way this person's been dealt with by us in the past, then I would ask Richard to log that as a complaint. And I know other assistant directors and directors do exactly the same. Okay, thank you. One of the things I've been reading and that's in the, uh, the public report, uh, which was sent out and that's the recommendations from the Ombudsman. Uh, the council must consider the report and confirm within three months the action it has taken to or proposes to take. The council should consider the report as it as its full council, cabinet, or other appropriately delegated committee of elected members. And we will require evidence of this. Um, can I ask how this is progressing, if it's actually been taken on board? It's also said that the council should also review its complaints procedure if it intends to continue with a, a one stage procedure it should ensure it has a system so that a senior manager not involved with the matter complained about carries out the investigation. Can I ask if this is underway? Sarah? Yeah, just just to be clear that you, you are that um, relevant elected member body to consider yeah. the report. So that's why we're bringing it to you as um, in, in terms of scrutinizing that report from the local government ombudsman. So you're fulfilling that particular part of the requirements from the ombudsman. Um, we've certainly reviewed the process that's been followed. And as they've identified within our one stage process, the, the person who's been involved in the original issue should never be the person that investigates it. And that's where we went wrong with this. Right. Um, that is within our training. It's always been part of the process, but unfortunately this one slipped through the net. Um, but Richard now has more robust methods in place to make sure that that doesn't happen again in the future. Okay, fantastic. Members, any more questions? Okay, just a quick one then. Compliments. So let's go from something negative. Let's switch it to a little bit positive. We all love a compliment. Compliments go a hell of a long way. And I, I like to ensure that the compliments actually get back to the people who's that compliment's been sent in about does does that happen? Does that get back to that person on the call face that you know somebody's wrote in about? Yeah, absolutely it does. <clears throat> Probably one of the problems we have is people get compliments, then don't tell us. Right. Because they just think they've done the job. Yeah. So we really try to encourage people to pass on compliments, pass on emails where they've been thanked. It's not an easy job sometimes. No, no. Yeah, and any compliment that comes direct to me from from the member of the public yeah. is always shared direct with the manager straight away. 
So is there, a, is there an easy route then for people to send compliments to? Because obviously on our website, it's, if you've got a complaint, you know, forgive me if I'm wrong, but is there something there? Have you got a compliment? Well, it's actually called Tell Us How We're Doing. So it fits fit, fits both sides of the uh, of the spectrum, really. Yeah. So, and the email address is complaints and compliments. So, you know, it's, it's, it's for either or. Yeah. So I know the figures on the report are not very high added with regards to compliments. Uh, no, they had, a, they had a decrease this year yeah. in the reporting year. And I think this next this next year as well is going to be, <laughs> the figures are going to be quite different, I should imagine, Yeah, 19 and 2021. So, but, uh, um, I know one of the things that Jackie Addison does within her department, and that's if any, any compliments that come through actually get put up on a, on a whiteboard, obviously when staff are working in the office environment, you know, is that something that we can maybe mirror throughout other departments? Obviously, when we get back to some sort of normality. Yeah, well, we yeah. have we have a weekly highlights in public services, and it, there are always compliments in there every every week. You know, if we get them, we send them through, and they're always put in. Good. Good. Okay. Questions, members, on compliments. No. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We shall move on to our next item. Sorry, just just to summarise that, I think there's only one thing really to come from that. I think that was a response to, to Councillor Dickinson. Wasn't it? it was just more of a, an insight as to how the uh, complaint came about in regards to the church bells. So I think you were going to get a, an email. I'll provide back. that tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think Robin wanted to come in. All right. Councillor yeah, Council, Dacre. Councillor Dacre, I do apologise. I have a memory like a sieve. I will let you come in. So, Robin. <laughs> Robin, did you want to come in? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it was just really to echo what, what Andy had said as well about um, about the compliments. Um, obviously, people, there's a lot more compliments that come in than compliments. But um, as Andy stated, a, a lot of the staff, they just seen as though they are doing the job. So, but I would do encourage my my team to any, any email, even compliment over the phone, to pass it on to me so it can let Richard know and likewise you can put it in some weekly highlights as well because it's it just raises morale as well for the um uh, for the team and it just lets lets people know that they are doing a good job. We know they're doing a good job but something that's there in writing maybe and it, it just lifts spirit especially at a difficult time. Yeah. It does it shows where we're doing things right. Councillor Dacre, I do apologize. I did miss you. I nearly skipped on then please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I just wanted to say first that my understanding from the report was, in fact, there were more compliments than complaints in the last year, 296 to 211, unless I've read the report wrongly. No, no, that, that is right on the annual figure. It's just the compliments had quite a nosedive from the previous year. But they're still in excess of the complaints, which I yeah, think yeah, yeah. is something that is a good for the Council. And if we think we're under-recording compliments, then that's even better. Mm. Um, however, obviously, as everyone has said, we don't want complaints. And if they do come in, we want them to be dealt with appropriately. I think the Ombudsman re public report says they accept that all councils make mistakes. What matters is how a council deals with them. And we have to accept that on two occasions here, firstly with the bells and then with the council tax complaint, the council hasn't dealt with them as it should. But I hope everybody is satisfied from what you've heard today, that really strong action has been taken to ensure that the processes in the future are robust, that tra new training's been offered, and so that we should be able to properly investigate complaints, satisfy the complainants, and ensure that the council does learn from the complaints that are made. And I think one lesson for me from this is that if you accept something in as a complaint you have to deal with it properly and I reading between the lines really that's what's happened perhaps with the church bells is that perhaps those dealing have shared some of the surprise that some of the members here have expressed that a complaint has come to the council about that but the point was that once it was in the system as a complaint it had to be dealt with properly um, and I'm sure that 
that lesson is being um, pushed home by Richard and his colleagues. So, um, so as I say, I just wanted to balance out the fact that in also of the 211 complaints that were received, 36.5% of them were upheld or partly upheld. And the rest of them, so that's more than half, were either withdrawn by the complainant or were not upheld. And I think that's also a figure that should be out there um, for everyone to hear. So thank you very much for allowing me to just make those comments, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dacom. Right, everybody happy that we move on to the next item? Okay, thank you, Robin, Richard, Sarah, and, and Andy. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome to stay. Item 6, the evolution process, scrutiny, function, and governance. Uh, members requested an update on the evolution process and timescales following a report in June 2020 specifically on the scrutiny functions and governance arrangements relating to the West Yorkshire Combined Authority and devolution. Additionally, members will consider how Calderdale has interacted with West Yorkshire Combined Authority to date and how it supports scrutiny members and how recommendations from the review on West Yorkshire Combined Authority and beyond have been incorporated and progressed. Ian Hughes, it's over to you. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I think that um, I had a message from Mike Lodge indicating uh, he wished to contribute to this. wasn't clear from that uh, message from Mike whether he wanted to do so at the start, um, but I'll give him that, that option at this stage if he wants to. Mike? You're on mute, Mike. Uh, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Chair. I just thought I'd talk a little bit about, uh, about scrutiny and scrutiny in the West Yorkshire Combined Authority and members will remember that under your auspices we did a bit of work on the West Yorkshire Combined Authority probably about two years ago I think Councillor Lynn was involved in that as a, a scrutiny councillor at that time and you produced a report that I think was um, fairly well received um, and that talked a little bit about scrutiny at the West Yorkshire Combined Authority which I think uh, everybody would accept at that time perhaps needed a little bit of improvement um, it was fairly, uh, fairly low key scrutiny. Uh, since our report, not I don't think directly because of it alone, but they have appointed a scrutiny officer, which they didn't have before, um, and um, they have started doing some more more um, briefings about the work of West Yorkshire Combined Authority that come out on a a monthly or certainly a regular basis. Um, uh, and the West Yorkshire Combined Authority scrutiny officer Khaled has has instigated uh, regular, occasional meetings, I should say, of scrutiny officers across West Yorkshire. So we get together more often and talk to each other about uh, scrutiny in each of the five uh, authorities and in the West Yorkshire um, combined authority. So I think on the scrutiny side, there has been some, um, some progress uh, in those areas. Uh, currently, the West Yorkshire combined authority has one scrutiny committee. It's made up of councillors nominated from uh, six councils. Um, I, I will pause whenever I, I get stuck because Ian is the expert on all things governance through the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. So the five councils are the five West Yorkshire councils and York. Is that right, Ian? Um, and uh, there are three councillors for each of the councils on that scrutiny committee. Councillor Baines, Baker and Foster are our councillors on that. And the scrutiny committee meets about... Um, three or four times a year. Uh, they also have a, um, a practice whereby the chair of that scrutiny committee always attends uh, full meetings of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority and has speaking rights. Isn't a member of that. Obviously, it would be inappropriate for him or her to be a member of that, of, of that committee, but is, is in attendance and is asked for, and, and, and is asked for views. Um, obviously, come May, assuming everything goes according to uh, plan and timetable, There'll be an election for um, a West Yorkshire mayor uh, and enhanced um, responsibilities for the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Um, and uh, I've had a, a note from the scrutiny officer at at West at the Combined Authority about proposals for um, uh, options options for 
enhancing scrutiny, which will have an impact on, on each of the councils. Uh, and basically, is he's got a very simple set of proposals. It's to keep, keep it with one scrutiny committee, uh, have two scrutiny committees or have three scrutiny committees. Um, the option for having two scrutiny committees would be to have one scrutiny committee that did uh, scrutiny in terms of looking at the decisions of the combined authority and one that did, um, they're, calling it, they're calling it an overview committee, which would do some of the more de the detailed review work that you've done uh, yourselves um, on things like commercialisation, that sort of thing. Um, the three committee model, they would uh, divide by... Um, by themes, which would be to have a corporate uh, scrutiny committee, an economy scrutiny committee, and a transport uh, scrutiny committee. Um, each of those committees would have three members. So, so the one that the, the status quo would have three three councillors from Calderdale going, as we have now. Um, the one with two committees would have would have six councillors from Calderdale going, and the one with uh, three would have nine councillors going. So, uh, I mean, I. I I have a view that nine councillors is quite a large number to be involved at the kind combined authority, but that there are increased uh, functions. Um, the other thing that uh, they are proposing and suggesting is that there should be more uh, West Yorkshire liaison across scrutiny, uh, so that uh, scrutiny chairs from each of the five, uh, each of the six local authorities, West Yorkshire's local authorities in York, should meet from time to time with the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Um, it may be that on occasions that the mayor is asked to attend those meetings. I know, I know Councillor Bellinger um, and Councillor Robinson have met, I believe, a few months ago with uh, uh, the West Yorkshire scrutiny chair of the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's um, probably a good idea. I don't think it wants to happen every fortnight, but you know, once every four months, once every six months would be a useful thing to do. So at that, at that point, Chair, if I may, I'll, I'll pause and ask Ian if he's got anything to add. Um, and then really uh, either, you know, members may have things to to suggest now or ask now or comment on, or we can pick comments up from members after this meeting and I'll produce a, a response to the combined authority. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Ian? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, that was a very useful um, summary from Mike, thank you, of the touching on the current arrangements and um, some of the thinking around what needs to be done to uh, enhance the, the scrutiny process, bearing in mind that the uh, mayoral combined authority, uh, if it comes into existence, will obviously um, be tasked with uh, a significant increase in its remit. So just to perhaps summarise then that the, the position at the moment is that the uh, mayor or the, the, the duly elected mayor and the combined authority will be scrutinised and held to account by the existing combined authorities overview and scrutiny committee. Um, those arrangements, however, as Mike has indicated, are currently under review and there is a working group of that overview and scrutiny committee, which is exploring what additional scrutiny arrangements might be put in place uh, to reflect the introduction of the mayor, uh, the scrutiny of additional mayoral and non-mayoral functions, and any statutory provisions that additionally are provided to the, the mayoral combined authority. So items under consideration, um, as part of that review uh, include, amongst other things, the lessons learned from other mayoral combined authority areas, uh, the most productive methods for scrutinizing the mayor directly with respect to the mayoral functions, uh, regional cooperation between local scrutiny and the combined authority scrutiny, as Mike has mentioned, and the number, again, as Mike has mentioned, and structure of uh, those scrutiny committees and importantly, the level of resources and support uh, that those scrutiny members would need to exercise uh, their duties. There has to be, I think, a balancing act between the resources that uh, sit with any enhancement in the scrutiny arrangements uh, to make it um, work in the way that it needs to work. Um, 
so again, summarising where we are at the moment, so the combined authorities overview and scrutiny committee that will continue to have the power to review and scrutinise the decisions made uh, or other action taken in connection with any function which is the responsibility of the combined authority. It will be able to make uh, reports or recommendations to the combined authority with respect to those functions and on matters that affect, affect West Yorkshire uh, or its inhabitants. And it will also have, does have the power to require any combined authority member to attend a scrutiny meeting to answer questions. Now, following the introduction of the elected mayor, the overview and scrutiny committee will also have the power to review and scrutinize the decisions made or other action taken in connection to the discharge by the mayor of any mayoral functions and make reports or recommendations to the mayor with respect to those functions and require the mayor and uh, any deputy mayor and any portfolio holder to attend scrutiny meetings to answer questions. Now, interestingly, under the new um, arrangements that will come into place, the committee will have the power to direct that a decision is not to be implemented uh, while it is under review or scrutiny and also recommend that the decision be reconsidered. And that's similar to our uh, call-in system. Mm. Um, but though those powers extend to decisions taken by the mayor regarding mayoral functions, so extending that over and above those that currently exist as far as the combined authority is concerned. Um, there will be, in addition to what might come into place from the work, those that Mike mentioned, uh, there will be separate oversight and scrutiny arrangements uh, to be carried out by a police and crime panel in respect of the PCC functions that have been transferred into the uh, mayoral combined authority. And that would include any actions or decisions of the mayor and deputy mayor uh, for policing and crime, which is a requirement, again, as you know, of uh, the mayoral combined authority. Mm -hmm. So, Chair, there's, there was due to be a workshop of that overview and scrutiny uh, committee a working group uh, that was postponed, unfortunately. I think that was due to sit yesterday um, in order to report back uh, to a meeting that's taking place next week. So there's a fair bit of work that's underway. Um, I can't obviously give an indication of um, what the conclusions of that working party um, will be or, or, or currently is because the report hasn't yet uh, taken place to the, the group next week. Uh, but it's something that can be updated uh, as that progresses. Um, you're obviously all aware that there's been a slight delay in the process to um, take this through the next uh, ratification stage, but that is scheduled now to happen on the 25th of November both at Cabinet and Council, in order for the legislative process of the laying of the order, the formal order that um, uh, sets up the combined authority, the mayoral combined authority to, to go through its legislative stage through Parliament. And then we, um, we prepare for the, the election process um, for next May. So hopefully, Chair, that gives you an understanding of the, the current arrangements, the thinking that is taking place around uh, what needs to happen to bolster those current arrangements, um, mm. and, and that will will evolve over the next uh, next few weeks, uh, if not months, uh, in the lead up to the creation and um, formation of the of the mayoral combined authority. Okay, thank you. It's really interesting that actually. I'm really looking forward to this to be quite honest. It could mean a huge difference to us as an authority. I think, Councillor Lynn. You wanted to come in at this point. You're still on mute, Councillor Lynn. Uh, Chair, I'm quite happy to come in after members of the uh, of the panel have come in. Uh, you know, because okay. I'm no longer a member of the panel. I have to keep reminding. <laughs> <them. laughs> I'm happy to come in. I keep, I keep forgetting. Ian, sorry. Sorry, Chair. If I just also just just the important. Um, 
issue of the continuation of the legislative process uh, in order for Parliament to be able to do what it needs to do to allow us to um, create the combined authority by next May is the the gain share funding for this current financial year will then be will but then be secured. So uh, oh. that's why it was necessary to just really tweak uh, the sitting of council this time in order for that to, to continue to be a process that's undertaken. Right. With regards. Obviously, the, the, the screw today, the scrutinising of the, the the mayor's position and the mayor's decisions. If obviously the, the three options, either the to one scrutiny meeting, uh, the two or, or, or three scrutiny boards. Obviously, if there's only the one scrutiny board, it's quite a lot of work probably to undertake, then, won't it? If they're having to deal with the, the usual scrutiny of West Yorkshire Combined Authority. As well as the scrutinising of the, you know, the, the mayor's decisions, you know, how, how do you envisage, envisage this working if, if they actually went for option one? Do you think it's something that's doable, or do you think they may struggle? I think it's important to to, to realise though that many of the combined authority functions will be subsumed into the role of the mayor, so it won't be the case that there'll be a. a, a a doubling of the, the the functions that are being considered by overview and scrutiny because they will just be, be differently placed. Right. Um, so I do accept, however, that there will need to be um, a thorough understanding of the the level of scrutiny that's appropriate for a mayoral combined authority because of the um, the way in which the um, the mayoral role is undertaken and the, the decision making that sits alongside that. And that is why, um, obviously, we're able to, to benefit from looking at existing combined authorities and see what has worked well mm. uh, and what the level of um, scrutiny processes uh, needs to be for uh, an area the size of West Yorkshire and the type of decisions taken. I suspect there will be some sort of enhancement um, of the scrutiny process, some additional members required from each of the constituent uh, authorities, uh, and probably more than the one overview and scrutiny committee. I think that um, those options that, that, that Mike mentioned will, will need to be uh, implemented in some way, which of those I think is, is not yet clear. Um, but we will benefit from, from previous um, experiences around the operation of this, but again, some of it uh, will be a requirement to see exactly how it progresses and the need to, to review that after a period of time of the, um, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority uh, being operational. Okay. And you see that if they do go to the three screws and your boards, what pressure that might put on us as, as an authority? Do you think there'll be more support needed from us at Calderdale or would it just come from, from within themselves? That's a very good question. Um, with an enhanced scrutiny function of that size, then uh, there's going to need to be, I think, uh, a recognition that uh, you can't just have one scrutiny officer dealing with that. It would be, I think, uh, a resource that would, would be too difficult for that to happen. Mm. Um, I think Mike's indicating he may have some further detail from the conversations he's had. Mike? I, I was actually going to sort of develop on one of the one of the things that I've observed by looking at the West Yorkshire Command Authority. So, so you as a scrutiny board meet monthly. Uh, you know each other as a team because you meet regularly together, and you meet you, you meet each other in different settings on Caldwell Council. Um, the the Command Authority Committee currently is eighteen councillors nominated by three counts three uh, three councillors from six councillors nominated. They only get together for that. They don't get to know each other. They don't get to meet together very often. And actually having that as a quite a, as a cohesive group is quite a sort of uh, organisational development challenge in many ways. I've got a lot of sympathy with the, with Khaled, the scrutiny officer there. He's He's got to build relationships with eight, 18 people used to working in different ways. And then it, a few months later, they change the chair or they change the membership, as happens here. here. But it's... It's a real challenge for them to get cohesive scrutiny in the same way that uh, that we and Leeds and Bradford and Kirklees can do it. It says a lot 
about continuity, doesn't it, really, of, of members within scrutiny boards? It really does help. Councillor Lynn, unless any members have got any questions. Councillor Lynn, I'll let you come in at this point. Right, OK. Yes, well, just to say thank you very much. I'm glad this is on the uh, on the agenda. Um, and I wanted to say that part of the reason why we did that report a couple of years ago, which, which Mike was fantastic in, in terms of pulling together, um, was because really, I, I mean, I had two particular concerns. One was that, you know, I really wasn't sure to what extent um, the combined authority was getting, was the subject of any genuine, genuine sort of effective scrutiny process. But the other, um, and, and I think it does, it's just been touched on about, about resources really. And the other was about the extent to which Calderdale Council was able to commit resources to support members of Calderdale Council who actually were participating in that scrutiny function really. Um, because I, I think that's really, I think that's really, really important. So I look, would look forward. I think it's it's really positive that in a way, because we're we're you know you're, you're a couple of years behind um, some of the other um, regions that have had mayors. I think it'll be really important to kind of learn from them. Um, but also, um, it's I just think from a from a Calderdale perspective, I think it's really really important that we that we do begin to gear up actually to to make sure that we are able to kind of scrutinise the decisions that are made by the mayor and the, you know, and the mayor's um, and the, the cabinet, if you like, that the mayor's got. Uh, because, and also because it's going to have such big, such a big impact on, um, on our capacity to do things in terms of economic development, in terms of transport, in terms of, of policing and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, so I, I don't envy the officers and, and, and Ian having to, to kind of, and, and Mike having to sort of tread you know tread a path through this but i'm really pleased that that the um the scrutiny panel has actually started to think about this and i and my own view would be that 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 it's strategy and performance by you know as the name suggests that really is the one that ought to be able to contribute possibly members towards that new um scrutiny function uh, but certainly some ex experience and expertise thanks thank you Councillor. i fully agree with everything that you said there Councillor Holden, just just one observation more than anything. Um, I, I I just have concerns as to how effective a panel of eighteen people can actually can actually be when you're trying to get down to the nitty gritty. You know, it, it's if if we if if you're doing uh, quite often, I've found the most effective scrutiny has been when there's been a very small group and. You know, does that need expanding from 18 councillors on one scrutiny panel and then trebling up? You know, I, I don't think I don't think you will get more effective scrutiny. I think I think you'd be better off splitting that 18 up into three scrutiny panels and doing it that way. And I think you, you'd have far more effective scrutiny personally doing it that that way than you would trebling the numbers. You know, I don't, I, from a personal point of view, I don't believe that that's the way forward. Mm. I can see, I can see your point there, actually, Council Holden, but I think the difficulty is, and I think like, I think Mike said earlier, that when you've got members from different authorities coming in and they don't see each other regularly, so they can't actually sit down and discuss things and they only see each other at those points of the meetings, it's, I suppose it's difficult for you to work alongside somebody to get things done. So it's it's how do they actually work that so you actually get to spend more time with that person so you can work on things. Councillor Porritt. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're going over what how we think this could look for us for West Yorkshire. And I'm just wondering, uh, Ian alluded to, um, obviously, there's other mayoral authorities that have already been formed over the last few years, and how relevant their practice and their, their successes would be to us, whether there are, whether there is an authority out there that looks perhaps very much like West Yorkshire, or, or whether we've got unique challenges um, that we're facing, really sort of, I guess, obviously, we're not going to try and reinvent the wheel. Um, but I'm, I am interested to know how other mayoral authorities are meeting these challenges and, and what we can learn from them. 
Ian left. Yes, it's a very good point. And um, the starting point really is to say that the most combined authorities um, started as we as did we with a just one overview and scrutiny committee. And there are some mayoral combined authorities that have continued with that. So um, it, it's difficult to assess for West Yorkshire certainly what will be the best method of trying to um, translate the current overview process uh, I I into one that satisfies the need for there to be check and challenge over the decisions that, that, that are going to be taken uh, by the mayor, um, some decisions which will continue to be taken by the members of the combined authority to, to ensure that that, that that level of challenge, that level of check uh, is, is appropriate and, and fit for purpose for, for the area of, of West Yorkshire. Um, some authorities, some combined authorities, some mayoral combined authorities have continued with just the one overview and scrutiny committee. And there is a criticism that is not sufficient. So I think the, pr the work that's underway is, is, is listening to those comments um, and trying to ensure that what is introduced for West Yorkshire um, come next May uh, start off with a recognition that there needs to be uh, an emphasis upon scrutiny that, that really does um, have the ability to look at the type of decisions that um, will be taken by a mayor. Uh, and that is a very um, interesting proposition for this area. It's not one that, um, that, that we will be used to. And some of those powers are, are, are very important. Um, and there will need, need to be the, an understanding that that is going to be something that is capable of being challenged and that there's a very straightforward process in place to enable that to happen. And I think there's a fair bit of work yet to do between now and next, next May just to, uh, to describe that um, once the work has been done and the decision taken as to what processes will be in place, how many scrutiny committees there will be. Mm -hmm. And that will include further discussions with other mayor or combined authorities. There are some which are, I mean, Greater Manchester is, is far too big to be a model that we we look at, but there are others across the country that we can we can consider uh, and and learn from. Okay. Is it is it nine or is it eleven that's in, in Manchester? Apologies. Um, ten. Ten. Oh, ten. Ten. Right in the middle. We're at five of them. So yeah, if, you, if you've got three from each authority, then you, you know, you're quite yeah. yeah. Plus, Manchester obviously has the the health um, element within it, which yeah. obviously we don't have uh, in West Yorkshire. So there's a, a massive massively complex process as part of that as well. Okay. There's not a lot of time left either, is there? It's, uh, it's up against us now, but we need to get this in place by May. Um, I, I think of, of the issues that are being considered and of the, um, the work that needs to be undertaken, this is an area that, that is advanced and, and, and I think to, to allow for there to be those discussions that need to continue to take place, it's, hmm. it, it's not under a significant time constraint, to be honest. Okay. Any, any more questions, members? No? Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. It's really interesting, actually. It's really, it's really good to see. And it, it'll be interesting to see what actually happens in the future with this and how we as an authority could potentially benefit more, hopefully, from this as well. Okay. Right. Moving on from that item. Um, item number seven, democratic services, virtual meetings. <laughs> members members request, requested a progress report on how meetings have taken place during the pandemic and any learning or opportunities that may have arisen from this process. What learning has there been and what will be taken forward? Has the remote working made for more inclusivity, work-life balance and increased transparency through use of the council's YouTube channel for streaming. Members are also keen to better understand the potential longer term impacts that these may be and any possible legis legislative changes that could alter the future ways of working. Ian, this is you again, isn't it, I think? It is, thank you, Chair. Um, members have to erase the time that elapsed between 6 p.m. this evening and 6.20 <laughs> p.m. 
the end, please. Why, what, what happened? <laughs> exactly. Thank you. And nothing. Um, in all seriousness, I think we have to recognise that occasionally uh, there will be slight technical uh, glitches and uh, systems do not function uh, quite as they as you expect them to. I am amazed sometimes when I log on first thing in the morning that my computer seems to want to do it in many different ways, even though it did it perfectly well the previous morning. It suddenly asked for authentication, which I have no idea what the password for that is. So it's, it's, it's strange how it happens sometimes. So a recognition that we will always have, have technical uh, glitches. Having said that, um, I would also like to, to say and compliment um, not just the members um, present on this board this evening, but all 51 members of, of Calderdale Council for uh, the speed and the good humour and the cooperation that has been shown uh, by you all um, with almost overnight a switch to a virtual meeting process. And from my personal take on what I've seen when I've been in meetings and particularly the last council meeting, um, I think that the systems have worked amazingly well. They have provided uh, members with the opportunity to, to discuss, debate and comment upon things that need to be debated, need to be commented upon and need to be discussed in the way that, that, that has taken place. And the quality of the debate, um, I don't think, has been affected by the fact that we're doing so uh, uh, by way of thumbnails on uh, small laptop screens. So my compliments to, to you all. Um, you've worked with us and you have worked um, with patience sometimes, with good humour, uh, and allowed officers to uh, to work up the systems in the way that we have, test them with you, uh, and learn from issues that take place uh, over the course of the the meetings that that we've run uh, over the last seven months or so. Um, so, what has worked well behind the scenes? There's been a great deal of work undertaken by a combination of all of the committee admin staff. IT staff who have worked tirelessly to ensure that the, the systems work, uh, that they are um, capable of being uh, able to take the numbers that we have sometimes in meetings. And I think the council meeting got up to about 70 members all on the meeting at the same time combined with officers. Um, and I know there have been frustrations and I know that there have been hardware issues around members' uh, IT equipment that I think We've hopefully worked through that. Uh, rolling out the introduction to uh, 365 has added to some of those issues. But again, I think that the, the dedication and commitment of the IT officers in particular have allowed that to, to work through as, as well as it can. Um, so I would look to endorse to members the need for there to be at some point in the future, and there is a, a cliff edge that's coming at us for May of next year, where unless the regulations are renewed, then there will no longer be the ability to hold a virtual meeting of any description for uh, a public facing council meeting that we, that we hold. Um, I haven't yet um, had any sort of significant um, steer on, on whether that is a, a regulation that will be uh, renewed or, or extended. Um, but again, a, a personal perspective on this is that having been through the processes we've been through, um, making use of the technology that we've made use of, allowing the public to participate and see the democratic processes in operation. Um, it would be a mistake, in my opinion, if that was taken away again. I think there's a, a need for it to be recognized as a tool that can be used to uh, enhance the inclusivity that's required, um, to enhance the ability of people who would otherwise 
I find it difficult to get to a physical meeting space and also enhance the ability that I'm sure uh, there is an opportunity for people who would otherwise perhaps not look to contribute to, to meetings of this type would do so through this medium. It's, it's a, an obvious point to make, but um, many, many people are so familiar with uh, the use of technology in social media systems and find this um, method so much easier than, than going to a physical meeting, standing up in a room for people and speaking. So it, it, it adds to all of that and adds to the inclusivity that's required. Um, so I think there needs to be a recognition that this needs to continue. Um, I think there also needs to be a modification of the, of the regulations to allow for a hybrid meeting so that we can hold a physical meeting plus some uh, contribution through the virtual process. Now that does bring with it further technical issues because of the, the need to combine those two. And I think uh, we would need to work very carefully on that to ensure that the presence of screens in the physical meeting space allowed there to be that um, interaction that would need to take place. So I think it's worked well. Um, I think one of the other things that is going to uh, contribute to the, the further digital journey that we're um, certainly taking at the moment is the introduction of the ModGov committee admin system, which um, should be capable of being introduced for the start of the next uh, municipal year. So that will again complement this process. It will provide members with access to documents uh, through an app-based system. It can be tailored to your particular requirements so you can be fed uh, reports and agendas uh, and information about those uh, committees and boards that you sign up for. And it should also streamline and make more efficient the production of the agendas and the report writing system and also the minutes that then follow on from that. So all of this adds to, and if you'd said to me back in March that um, almost overnight, the, the cultural shift that were needed to take place both from officers and members to bring about this virtual system that we now have, I'd, I'd have said, well, that's fine, but we need 18 months to two years to make sure we get that right. We did it overnight, you did it overnight. And you know, we haven't got everything exactly as we need it to be, but it's, um, it's a massively impressive system uh, that allows for this type of discussion to take place. So hopefully Chair, that's given a, 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 my overview of, of, of where we are with that um, and happy to take any, any questions. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, I appreciate that, that as well, actually. It's, I, I think with these meetings, it, it allows for more transparency as well. It also is obviously more accessible for people to, to see, like you said, rather than actually going to the town hall, there's more people to see how the process takes place. One of the things that I, I thought of, actually, whilst you were, whilst you were talking, was regards the, the, the public eye system which we have in the town hall, which I know we're actually, you know, we pay so much to have that in place. Um, are we actually still paying for the use of that, even though we're not currently currently using it? We are, Chair. It's a system that we had, and, and it was a system that we did uh, consider um, when we needed to go to the virtual process as to whether it was a platform upon which we could run uh, meetings of, of this type. Um, I think at the time when we were looking to, to need to hold the virtual meetings, we wanted to go with uh, a tried and tested system and one that was as easy to use as we could possibly make it, both um, for members and for officers and for linking in with uh, members of the public through, through YouTube. So, I mean, I hadn't heard of Zoom before, um, March of last year. Uh, I don't think many of us had, um, but it's demonstrated again that it is a system that is relatively straightforward to use. It's become, uh, I think, the, the go-to um, platform for, for holding meetings of this type. Mm. Um, Public Eye has that functionality, certainly, but it, it, we didn't have the time, I don't think, to spend on uh, developing it 
with public eye uh, in a way that um, would allow us to have gone down the virtual route as, as quickly as we did. Okay. Uh, Council Robinson. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say I totally agree with um, with Ian. Totally agree with Ian. Um, you know, Zoom meetings are absolutely great because they're more accessible for the public. They can actually get involved in the Zoom meeting without actually having to be there in person and having to go to Halifax. Uh, the YouTube system is fantastic. There's more transparency there. Um, we're more democratically accountable, indeed, as well. Uh, thinking it, thinking of it selfishly as a councillor, um, there's always the issue um, when you are a councillor. You think, how long can I actually carry on? Because it does put you under a lot of pressure. Um, as as you go throughout your career, you end up getting more pressure in your professional job. Um, you know, there's been times when I've struggled to get to town hall meetings on the M62, for example. That causes a lot of anxiety. Um, so they're a super thing, you know, in the future, if I do, who knows if I, if I do end up going back to a professional workplace, who knows what's going to happen, but I can quite easily imagine myself zooming into a council meeting from my actual workplace um, after hours. It's, it's an absolute, it's such a progressive thing, virtual Zoom meetings, and we really do need to carry on. Now, I appreciate that it's down to um, legislation, national legislation, so more, I'm more than happy to, um, if we could send something from the council, I don't know, do a council representation to the government and say this needs to carry on. Um, I appreciate that probably full councils would be, would be better in person. I appreciate that because I do like seeing you guys in the flesh. Um, so, <laughs> and there might even be a system where we have a couple of scrutinies a year in person as well. But definitely, we've learned so much from this experience and we might as well carry on. So, thank you. Okay. Are you putting a, are you putting a recommendation forward there, George? Yeah, Happy to sign that, Chair. Thank you. I think, Chair, the recommendation should be that there should be options for both, uh, as the sort of said, um, because I think, you know, Zoom meetings might not be suitable for all, for everybody, but I think the option in terms of equality should be sort of should be there, and I think you know people should be able to choose whatever they want to do and however they want to get in, engaged in, in in the meeting. Okay, cheers, Councillor Naim. Councillor Robinson, with with regards to your recommendations, your recommendation is for us to actually push government then to to continue this way of meeting. Yeah, I, I think take, taking Naeem's point, I think that the best way forward would be for us to, uh, or for, for the panel to recommend that the council makes a, represent, rep, uh, a representation to government to um, keep a permanent change in the law, which allows councils to have virtual meetings. And then therefore it's up to the council how we progress that. Um, I think as long as we've got that flexibility there at a national level, then we as a council can decide how we choose to implement it. Okay. Well, I, I agree. I'll fully endorse that as well. Um, yeah, I support that. Okay. Members, any more questions? No. Okay. Council point. I'm not so much a question, more a comment. Um, uh, Ian was, was complimenting us, and while we're on compliments, um, I want to set to forward our compliments to IT, to business support staff, to democratic support staff, everyone who's been involved in making this work possible to continue. And we were up and running so fast. I understand we were one of the first local authorities to to get over to virtual meetings, and yeah, we're all. This is what we do now, and I do miss sometimes going to the town hall I don't always want to sit you know where I can hear my family eating in the next room um, I, I would like to have that blended approach I think that would be fantastic coming together two or three times a year and and having the flexibility to do this I, I just 
it, it's, it feels obvious, doesn't it now to us that this is, this is how, this is one of the tools that we have at our disposal and to lose that would definitely be a backward step. But yes, my compliments to all, everybody that's been involved in making our virtual working possible because it, it's, it's, it's been fantastic. Okay. I fully support- I want to endorse those, those comments. Yes, thanks. Yeah, I fully support that as well, Councillor Porrick. Is there something, Lauren, that can be put together then? An email from the Strategic Performance Scrutiny Board, thanking the IT. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. We can do that. And I'm sure Janet will include it in the minutes as well. Okay, brilliant. I, I, I must admit, I, I do miss actually having face-to-face -face meetings with people. Um, you can read people better when you sat next to them <laughs> and it's in the same room. And I think we just miss the love of each other as well, don't we, at the end of the day? So, and going to Weatherspoons maybe for the you know, discussions afterwards. Can't, we miss Naeem's coffee. <laughs> yeah, I know. Council Holden, <laughs> especially when it's Naeem's around, yeah, Council Holden. Yeah, I have to say, I do miss, I do miss uh, it being Naeem's round. Um, <laughs> Just, just like to echo Victoria's comments. Um, having worked in in that industry, I know exactly what's been involved in in actually implementing it. And no matter what we get told as a panel, it will be tenfold the stressful nights that those guys will have gone through, working probably all hours to pull this off, has been um, nothing short of a miracle. Um, one question I've got. It's just a very quick one. Is given that we are going over to Office 365, is there going to be a move over to Teams from from Zoom? Because uh, I'm thinking there's, there's obvious cost benefits if we're already paying for Office 365 um, by by sort of relinquishing any Zoom licenses that we might be paying for. It's a very good point and uh, one that is under consideration because the functionality within within Teams obviously allows for uh, meetings of this type. Um, again, this is a personal comment. I don't find Teams as good as uh, the Zoom functions. Um, it's not as, um, as easy to use the Teams process. But having said that, you know, we'd have probably said the same about switching to the use of of any virtual platform at the very start. So I'm sure it's a, it's just a learning process to become more familiar with Teams. So yes, I think once we've got everybody um, installed with, with Office 365 and, and has the functionality of Teams, it, it comes as part of that package. So um, it wouldn't make a great deal of sense to continue to spend money on Zoom licenses if, if we don't have to. Having said that, the Zoom licenses are fairly reasonable. It's not a significantly um, high amount of money that is being spent currently on Zoom licenses. So I think it, it needs to be weighed up as to what we would what we would lose perhaps from giving up Zoom and whether Teams does replicate that. Um, we also need to think about it as well as far as um, compatibility with modern Gov, which will be a discussion that will take place with again with the, the IT guys over the next few months. It's just practice Ian. That, uh, and could I also add, Chair, whilst we're at it, oh. Ripon the Parish Council beat Calderdale to um, to the to the post as far as going digital. We had our first first meeting, I think, after the day after the legislation came in. Um, first, our first virtual meeting. They have they do have a really good IT guy though, apparently. I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay. Um, Councillor Dickinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's actually a question born out of entire IT ignorance in this regard. Um, Zoom's free to use across a whole broad range of um, gear that I have, whether it's my phone, my laptop, or my uh, my iPad. Um, I don't know if there's any. It might actually might be helpful for Rob to answer more than anybody else. Um, is is Teams? Or our ability to use Teams is still going to be um, free across platforms for the likes of me to download and use for free? I mean, uh, or do I need to buy the full package for my personal use? As, as councillors, we're all being given Office 365, which includes Teams anyway. Um, but yeah, you could use, you could use Teams um, with any, any sort of per 
personal license. And it's worth noting that the free version of Zoom does limit you to 40 minutes, I believe. Um, I know that was relaxed during during lockdown, but that will, if it's not already, that will be brought back in. Mm. Yeah, that's 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 true. But um, my point being is that I don't have to pay for Zoom as it as it currently stands across the whole range of uh, things that I use. Um, I'm just uh, wondering if I would have to buy Teams or three six five or whatever it is for my personal use in order to be able to use Teams for on other platforms for my um, for, for my for my scrutiny meeting, say for example. But no, you you'll get that as. <clears throat> Sorry, as you as you put on to Office three six five through the council, you'll okay. actually get Teams as part of that, and that can be installed on any device that you have. Gotcha. I appreciate that. Thanks, Rob. Yes, sir. thank you. Councillor Dickey wants to come in on with a comment on Teams. Um, well, yes, I did. I'm just not sure if you haven't missed out Councillor Lynn somewhere along the line. No, I've got I've got Councillor Lynn. She wants to come in at the the end. All right. Okay. Yeah, it was just to say that. Um, in relation to teams, I don't know whether there's a consideration about the ability of people outside to use it because, and I gather it's free to install, or so I was told yesterday by somebody who was installing it on my, uh, on one of our devices, but it's some individuals who might want to participate may have Zoom, may not have teams. It's just a, a query about whether it would make any difference for those meetings where we're wanting the public to participate um but yes uh, and, and rob's councillor holden is right about the fact that the count the council uh, i took my laptop along when i went over to 365 and i can now access the council's internet on on my laptop and so i have microsoft teams on my laptop so if you have a device that you think you're going to use you just take it along and they will sort it out so that you can get that on on your own personal device but that you are secure okay councillor Hol council holland did you, were you going to come back in there on that one yeah yeah if i could um it i mean we've we've been using teams at, at parish council level um and, and we do have public participation and we you know we have members of uh, various committees that are co-opted in from the general public and they've actually connected up to, to all our meetings and, and taken part. In fact, last week, we even conducted interviews to co-opt um, the 12th councillor following a vacancy. And that was carried out via Teams as well. So, you know, it, it, the prob the, I think one of the issues that we will have, and that, that would be my only reservation for moving from Zoom, would be it's, it's learning another system. You know, I think we've got we've got 51 councillors, um, some of which are very IT literate, some of which, like my group leader, who I'm surprised we didn't have to drag screaming and kicking um, into the 21st century, not so much IT literate. You know, so there there are it's it's quite a varied skill base as as a group of councillors, um, and I think we've got to bear that in mind when when any any decisions are made. Mm -hmm. um, once you know if we've if we've got everyone on one platform and they're all using it pretty well there is a good argument to say don't 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 start reinventing the wheel okay council point did i see you indicate at one point sorry okay ian yes it, it was just really i think a follow-up on, on on the point that council holden's just very um appropriately covered off that as with Zoom, you don't you have to don't have to pay for accessing a Zoom meeting because that's the license holder who sets that meeting up. So it's a similar mm -hmm. process for Teams. You have to have uh, for the first time installed on your your laptop or or, or, or device. Um, but it's something we need to understand as to how accessible it is. The point that uh, the councillor Dacre made. We don't want to get to this point and and have the inclusivity inclusivity that we've arrived at. Uh, only for that to drop off through our poor choice of a, uh, a virtual platform system. So we'll need to explore all of that and make sure we get it right. Okay. Councillor Robinson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, we, um, whilst it's, I think it's good to use Teams uh, for, the, for the Council, 
Um, I think we do need to keep the Zoom licence because it is much more accessible when we're dealing with other parties, um, even residents. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd ask you to keep, keep Zoom licence rather than just moving to Teams uh, because it, I can imagine it causing a lot of issues in the future and we'd probably think, well, we might as well have just stayed on Zoom. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Okay. I think, Chair, can I just come in? I, I think as long as, we, as long as we are consistent in terms of what we use, because yeah. I think different, different people would use different platforms. Uh, I'm on the West Yorkshire Police and Crime Panel, and they use Skype, for, uh, for example, and that's totally out of order because, uh, you know, that's, I, I just can't get used to Skype, particularly when I've got Zoom and, and, and this. But Wakefield Council, apparently, because that's where it's actually hosted from, they, can't, they don't use anything else but Skype. So, you know, and some of our IT doesn't work with Skype, uh, or well, certainly my uh, mind doesn't. So as long as there is some consistency um, uh, that we do in, in Collardale, it'd be all right. But I think we need to bear in mind what others are using outside West Yorkshire because we have some interlink with other, other authorities as well. Okay. I mean, I'm a big believer in why try and repair something that doesn't need fixing. You know what I mean? So if it works, we stick to what works best. Councillor Lynn, I'd like you to come in at this point. Yes, yes, thanks. It's just a, it's just a kind of minor point. I wanted to pass it on and see what Ian thinks about this. Um, somebody was speaking to me um, who had um, tuned in to look at a cabinet uh, meeting, and had said that, uh, and it was somebody who isn't, you know, particularly, uh, you know, you know, terribly into politics or whatever, but was kind of confused at the vast number of councillors that were on. The, that were sort of on the screen really um and and because understandably um you've got your six or seven members of the cabinet um uh, you know you've got you know you've got some officers on there but then and then you've got other so i just wondered to what extent we'd ever thought about having a situation where um where what happened was that you know for example the cabinet the cabinet um chaired by the leader um and you have people on there but then when when people are wanting to ask a question or whatever, then then they're kind of like brought in. I don't know, maybe that sounds a bit bureaucratic, but it was just, I could sort of really see why somebody would say, oh, well, and who's that, that's that person? And who's that person? Um, because it could be quite confusing. Either that, or perhaps one needs to relabel people so that you put cabinet members so-and-so, so-and-so. So you don't just put the name of the councillor, but you actually put what they're there, what they're on the screen for. And then people who don't have a, a label as being a member of cabinet, just appear as as councillors that want to engage with the with the cabinet process. But just a thought, and it may be that it that it doesn't affect anybody else. But it, it was just a comment. I thought I'd pass pass on at this stage. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, councillor. Yeah, I was just saying, just as we are basically in in this particular meeting this evening. Yes, I think I think both you and councillor Dacre have quite rightly um, have in um, brackets after your your role as a name as councillor, the fact that you are cabinet members. So I think that's something that we are hopefully implementing for every cabinet meeting that takes place. Mm -hmm. All other councillors will should be um, should be named as councillor. And I have been spending the first five, 10 minutes of every cabinet meeting just renaming people if they've uh, omitted to do that. So um, I've been tempted sometimes to think about more suitable names, but I haven't yet done that in a public meeting. Um, so I think the latter suggestion, Councillor Lynn, is, is, is the better to have as far as possible a depiction of the physical meeting that would take place. And in Commission Room B, we'd have members of the public there and councillors. Uh, and I think this, this is, a, is, is, is an addition to that because you wouldn't know if you're sitting in the, the gallery in the Commission Room B, who is a councillor who might be sitting next to you because we've no labels that they hang around their necks at least on this system you can see who the councillor is and you may never have come across that particular individual before mm. and, and you see that person that that, uh, that councillor for the first time and you're told who uh, he or she is um the waiting room system i think produces an, an artificiality that, that perhaps isn't as uh, as useful as maybe it sounds a it means that you have to remember to bring people in and out of the meeting and it's difficult for the process for that individual who's there uh, to make it known that they wish to ask a question. So it's, 
it would be an added layer of complexity, I think, that um, that is quite simply solved by your suggestion, Councillor Lynn, that we make sure that labels uh, are accurate uh, and say exactly who the individuals are. Okay. Any other questions from members? Can I suggest that that's the recommendation that we start immediately with, effect, with the immediate effect, to be honest, because that does make a, a lot of sense that everybody is actually labelled properly and even officers with their job titles in terms of what they are, who they are. And, uh, and, and as, as the cabinet members were there, and if all councillors could actually be named as councillors, it would be helpful. Yeah, no, I agree, I'll select on that. I just, I just wanted to say something, <laughs> okay. I think you might need some new earphones because every time you speak, I don't know, it's not, it, I get this like whistle coming through my speakers. It sounds like a plane coming into land. I don't know if anybody else has picked that up. Sounds I'm like sorry, that one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Your yes, hearing aid, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll look into that. <laughs> Let's recommend that as well. <laughs> sorry. Christmas is coming. I could do with one of those fancy AirPods, AirPods things. <laughs> Okay, right. So I think that's it, isn't it, members? I don't think there's any more questions on that. I really appreciate that. It's been a good discussion, actually. In fact, in fact all three have been very good discussions this, this evening. Um, Councillor Lynn, sorry, we indicating there. No, <laughs> oh, problem. Right, okie dokie. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate your time this evening on those two, those two items. Okay. Uh, final item is our work programme for 2021-2021. Thank you, Ian. Lauren, I think this is... Uh... Yeah, no problem. Um, just to say that after the last meeting, that's been updated. So the version that members have got is the most up-to-date one. Um, as always, Sorry. welcome. Apologies. Apologies, Lauren. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you there. But let me just go back. I know Ian's left the room. Summarised from the last item. And, oh, uh, no problem. <laughs> all right, don't worry. Right, OK, so we've got three. And, and Ian's left as well, but we can, at least we can note this and send this to Ian anyway. We can, yeah. A representation from Collardale to government with regards uh, the continuation of virtual meetings. That's one of the things that we need to say in that. Uh, an email of thanks from strategy and performance to IT and uh, the appropriate labelling of members in, in future meetings. Obviously, if it's a cabinet meeting, it's a cabinet member. Cabinet members, again, labelled as they are tonight in whatever other meetings they're in. Uh, I think so. We, we know how it, how it goes. Okay, so they're the th they're the three things summarised from that last that last item. Apologise, I was rushing up, rushing ahead there, trying to get the work program done. Okay, moving ahead on to item eight. Apologies, Lauren. No problem at all. Back, over, back over to you. <laughs> Yeah, so members have got the most up-to-date version there. So as always, just welcome any amends or comments to that. Um, also, just to mention that we had an informal scrutiny chairs and deputies meeting. And out of that, a piece of work was suggested by, I think, um, Robin around sort of the street scene in Calderdale. Yes. Um, Councillor Bellinger and Councillor Robinson have picked that up and said that it would be really good if we did a joint piece of work across S&P and PLACE. Um, so you might have seen an email. We've had a few volunteers come forward and a few additional ones. So we're looking to set up a task and finish group around that piece of work in due course. So we'll get in touch with the members um, who have volunteered for that. And then we'll do the bit of work. And then it's likely that the report will come back to strategy and performance with the place members that have been involved for final sign off. So if there's any questions or additions, happy to take them. Right. OK. Is there, any, is there any other members in this board that fancy joining us on that? I know, I think Council Dickinson, Council Alden, uh, you're both on. Um, yeah, and then we've got Councillor Caffrey and um, Councillor Audrey Smith. Okay. Um, I think one other from place. Should have written them down. <laughs> Councillor Naeem? Were Councillor Naeem on it? Oh, Councillor Naeem. Yes, Naeem's I'm on it. Yeah, I thought so, yeah. yeah. Am I whistling again? Yeah. Right, okay. But if anybody else, I know as Rob said earlier on, you know, when you get too many people on something, it sort of like dilutes it a little bit. But I think the thing is that we're all under the same authority, so it'll make it a little bit easier. But, um, and, it, you know, the street scene affects all our wards. So, but yeah. Sorry, Lon. No, that's it. That's all from me. Just um, if there is anything, happy to pick it up outside of the meeting. But yeah, 
we'll uh, we'll get in touch with members as soon as we're ready to go with that. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> Any questions, members, on on the work program and the the street scene? No. Okay. Right. On that note, then I declare this meeting finished. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>